Brooke, thanks so much, uh, and thanks to our viewers for joining for this very special live event, a live interview with Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel during uh, what can only be described as an extremely busy and challenging time uh, for the Defense Department, for the administration, uh, for the country. Uh, we appreciate the Defense Secretary taking the time with us. Uh, we also are doing this from a very special venue. Uh, we're here today in Newport, Rhode Island at the Naval War College. Uh, this is where America's present and future military leaders are trained. There are more than 500 of them uh, joining the audience today. And it's not just American. There are some 63 countries represented here and many of the countries that are right in the center of the stories that we are covering today. Representatives from Estonia, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Turkey, Egypt, uh, Israel. Uh, these are the decision makers uh, that are going to be dealing with these crises just like the Defense Secretary uh, in the coming months and years. Uh, again, thank you Secretary Hagel for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, ISIS is at the top of the minds uh, of many Americans, and certainly the administration as well. Uh, President traveling to Estonia, you heard his comments earlier today, uh, when he described in, in more definitive terms than we've heard so far what the American mission is when it comes to ISIS, and he used the terms degrade and destroy. That is the goal. Vice President Joe Biden took it a step forward, at least in rhetorical terms, a short time afterwards, saying, in his words, uh, we will follow them to the gates of hell because hell is where they reside. Now, soon after the president, moments in fact after he uttered the terms, uh, the words degrade and destroy, he went on to say that the goal may be to make ISIS a more manageable threat, uh, which seems to imply contain rather than destroy. And I want to ask you, which is it? Is the mission goal to contain or destroy, and what mission have you and the Defense Department been tasked with? Well, first, Jim, let me uh, thank you and CNN for an opportunity uh, to uh, bring this group together and focus on uh, the uh, really pretty exceptional leadership and commitment to our country that's represented here uh, today, as well as our foreign partners. Uh, I also uh, want to thank the Admiral for uh, hosting us. Uh, my old friend and uh, former Senate colleague, uh, Senator Jack Reed, is in the audience. Uh, he and um, Governor Link Chafee gave me a visa to come into the state for, uh, uh, for a few hours. I shall uh, get out before sundown, as I said. But uh, thank you for what you do, Senator Reid and Admiral and to all of you. And I want to thank all of our men and women across the globe for their commitment to our country. I also understand that your father is in the audience, who uh, uh, is a Navy veteran. So uh, to your father, thank you. Uh, to your question, well, I think the President's uh, statement, which I did read uh, and aware of both he and the Vice President's news conference, was pretty clear to um, degrade and destroy the capability of ISIL uh, to come after U.S. interests uh, all over the world and our allies. Uh, however way he uh, addressed that later in the news conference, uh, I wasn't aware of that. But our mission, as you've asked us uh, what, what that mission is, based on what the Commander in Chief has asked of us, uh, is to uh, provide him those options and those plans to accomplish the mission of uh, destroy and uh, degrade the capability of ISIS. We are doing that, as the President said, not just militarily, because that is but one component. The President's been very clear on that point. But, uh, it uh, also requires a stable, new, inclusive government in Iraq, which uh, we are hopeful will be in place next week. Uh, it is the people of Iraq, the people of the Middle East, that will make uh, their ultimate decisions and determine their future. We can support them. It's also bringing a, uh, uh, a group with us uh, of like-minded uh, countries that appreciate the threat that ISIL represents to all of us, and I think you know many of the countries, France, Great Britain, uh, Canada, Australia, Albania, others, uh, to, to bring that coalition with us. That's another part of it. Uh, authorizations, airstrikes, uh, budget uh, issues. The President's been very clear. He wants the Congress involved with him. Uh, we've been consulting with the Congress. So it's all of those components, but the mission is very clearly, and we're providing the President with those options to, uh, to degrade and destroy ISIL's capability. That's the end game, degrade and destroy, not that's, contain. 
Uh, no, it's not contained. It's exactly what the president said. Degrade and destroy. I want to talk about, about the threat to the U.S. homeland in particular from ISIS because there have been mixed signals from the administration as to how imminent and severe that threat is. Two weeks ago, you said ISIS is, quote, an imminent threat to every interest we have. And, and you went on to say it's unlike any threat we've ever seen. After your comments, the administration seemed to pull back somewhat. You had the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff describe it as a regional threat, something the president did later that same week, in fact, last Thursday, saying that ISIS poses an Im immediate threat to the people of Iraq and the people of the region. He did not say immediate threat uh, to the U.S. homeland. Uh, this is key. We have many folks back home wondering uh, what threat it poses to them and their families. Is it an imminent threat to the U.S. homeland or to the region? Well, first of all, I didn't say homeland. I said to U.S. interests. But you said uh, an imminent threat to every interest we have. That's right. I didn't say uh, homeland. I said to all of our interests. Look at, look at what just uh, happened 24 hours ago on the latest video uh, of uh, a, another citizen mm -hmm. as to what ISIL uh, did. It is a threat. ISIL is a threat to this country, to our interests. Obviously, uh, Prime Minister Cameron of Great Britain made that pretty clear a couple mm -hmm. of days ago. The President of the United States has said, the, they are a threat. The Attorney General of the United States has said it in similar uh, language. That it, the Secretary of Homeland Security, Director of National Intelligence. So uh, th these are very real threats. Or if they weren't real threats, then the President wouldn't uh, be saying, giving us the mission to go out and degrade and destroy the capability. No, no question. And I'm not denying that officials have said it's, it, it's a threat. The specific question is, is it a threat to the U.S. homeland at this stage, or is that a distant potential a threat, and for now, ISIS is focused largely on gains in Iraq and Syria. Well, I think, Jim, uh, part of that answer is, as we have acknowledged publicly, uh, we are aware of over 100 U.S. citizens uh, who have U.S. passports, mm -hmm. who are fighting in the Middle East uh, uh, with ISIL forces. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be more. Uh, we don't know. We can't take a chance, Jim on saying, well, let's technically define this. Is it a real threat today or tomorrow, or is it going to be in six months? That's the way not, uh, the threats don't work in little neat boxes and emanate on our time frame. They emanate on their time frame, and the President's point being to uh, degrade and destroy their capabilities so that it doesn't get to your question. Uh, we know they're a threat. We know they're brutal. We know that they are, as I've said, as others have said, something that we've never seen before. They're better organized. They're better funded. They have more capability. They're better structured. There's a dangerous, dangerous ideology of a brutality, uh, barbaric nature, nature that we've not seen before. So my job as Secretary of Defense is not to second guess what may be or w what's uh, going to be, but we've got to protect, do everything we, we can to protect our country, our interests, at, this, uh, at, the, uh, uh, at, at the command of our Commander-in-Chief as to what he needs in order to uh, do his job. So, so it sounds to me like you're operating, that, that, that this to some degree is not knowable, uh, that, that there's a potential threat, and I've had many intelligence briefings uh, where, where intelligence officials have told me that is the concern. Uh, Americans or Europeans returning home with those passports possibly carrying out attacks. While they may not have a credible uh, threat where they know the date and the time of the, the target, that's a potential threat. But it sounds to me like you're operating as Defense Secretary that that threat could be immediate and therefore uh, you're, you're uh, reacting so that you could prevent that from happening. That is part of our mission and that's uh, again uh, not only my mission, mm -hmm. my responsibility as Secretary of Defense, but uh, as you know from our other cabinet members, the Attorney General, the Secretary of Homeland Security, Director of National Intelligence, all our intelligence agencies, all of us together working law enforcement uh, on this. But there are capabilities we have, missions that we can perform, just as the President has instructed us to perform those missions, giving him the options, that um, we have to take seriously. And I can't uh, second guess what may come or may not come. Uh, this crowd is as dangerous a group of people beyond just terrorists. They are an army with marrying this with an ideology and capacity to do things. They, they, they control half of Iraq today. They control half of Syria today. Uh, we better be taking them seriously. So if you are taking them seriously, and I hear urgency in your voice, why isn't there an urgency in articulating and defining to the American people what the strategy is 
to react to the threat from ISIS, whether in the region or at home? Well, I think the President has made that uh, very clear. First, as he has said, uh, we need to concentrate on, and we have been, uh, Secretary Kerry's area of responsibility, but we all have this, uh, is doing everything we can to support the Iraqi people as they come together, forming a new inclusive government. But as you know, uh, Iraqi politics move very slowly, and frankly, the terror threat is and is likely to move more quickly than the Iraqi political process. Jim, if you'll let me finish answering the question. That's but one component, and we're working on that. What the President has talked about bringing uh, a group of countries together. Secretary Kerry will be doing this right after the NATO uh, conference. I'll be involved in this. We have been. So is our CENTCOM commander, uh, others. In, in bringing a group together that together uh, can help support forces in Iraq and Syria and the Middle East uh, who uh, respect freedom and dignity and the choices that uh, people will make. Military is part of that. Planning is part of that. Working with the Congress is part of that. Resources are part of that. Asking the follow-up questions, if you do this, if you take this action, what will that lead to? Is this the right action to take? So there's a strategy to this. As the President said in his reference last week, uh, putting the cart before the horse, you, you, you can't do that. We, we've got to bring a coalition together and do the other things that we are building, we are doing, with a sense of urgency. There's no, I think there's a little question in my mind that there's a sense of urgency. I think the President has been pretty clear about that. Is part of the strategy uh, military strikes inside Syria? Well, that's an option, and we're looking at all those options. Have you prepared those options for the President? The President's asked us for different options, and, and we've uh, prepared those for And Syria airstrikes are among them. All, their, all of these things are options that uh, the President wants to see, and, and we've been working with the White House, not just starting with working with the White House, we've been working with the White House for weeks. Uh, the President talks to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Ambassador Rice, National Security Advisor, talks to uh, all of us, the President talks to me, Talk to Lloyd Austin and the Commanding General CENTCOM. So this isn't something that just popped up the last mm -hmm. week or two. Uh, we've been working this for the last few weeks. To accomplish that mission, as you describe it, degrade and destroy, can you, in your view as Defense Secretary, accomplish that without military action inside Syria, in light of the fact that ISIS controls territory on both sides of what is effectively a non-existent border? Well, as I said, it, it's a number of options, and we plan for all those options, but one thing that we uh, I hope we, we can accomplish with the Congress is uh, the Congress going forward and funding the President's request for $500 million mm -hmm. uh, in funds to help support the uh, Syrian moderate opposition. This is part of the counterterrorism mm -hmm. partnership fund that the President put forward. The Congress has not acted on that yet. I would hope uh, the Congress would, but we, we look at all options. You have to look at all the options. There was a moment last week when the White House spokesman, Josh Earnest, seemed to imply that the Pentagon had not yet completed uh, the options to present to the President. Have you placed options on his desk already for uh, military action inside Syria? Jim, options are, are constantly being defined and refined. This is a dynamic process. It isn't just start with five days ago the President asked for an option. We're constantly providing different options uh, and contingency plans for different things. So um, the missions, or whatever the commander in chief requests of a specific mm -hmm. mission wants from us, th then we tailor uh, sure. our responses and our options to whatever that mission is, as he had just, just clearly defined it today. So, so the to president has on his, on his desk a, a, an option for attacking He has Syria. options uh, all the time that we're refining. We're, in fact, yesterday we were just uh, in touch again and two or three times a, a day before she left with the president mm -hmm. with Ambassador Rice. Do you think it's a mistake for the president to have ruled out boots on the ground uh, to, to contribute to this action? Because you talk to generals, former and present, who will say air power is limited in what it can accomplish. Well, the president has been very clear about we're not going to go back into mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Iraq the same way we came out of Iraq uh, a, a few years ago. That means a combat action, so-called boots on the ground combat action for American troops. But we're not going to do that. I support that decision. I think it's the, the right decision. Now, to your, your bigger point about just airstrikes, no, just airstrikes alone uh, won't fulfill, accomplish 
what the, the, the mission uh, is. This is why I go back to an earlier answer I gave on this is a larger dimension of many pieces. One is, is a functioning, credible, trustworthy, inclusive Iraqi government that's being formed now, uh, coalition partners, building coalitions in that area, so everybody has a role and everybody can participate, and we're making good progress on that. Uh, it's what are our military uh, options. Uh, it, it's many of these different dynamics that, that flood into one. Airstrikes is one. We've seen airstrikes have worked pretty, pretty well uh, so far in the limited missions that, that uh, the President has given us to use airstrikes, and they've, they've been pretty effective. I wonder if I could turn now to one of the other major international crises that, that is on your plate now, and that's, of course, the situation in Ukraine. Does must Russian military action to date inside Ukraine constitute an invasion? Well, there are Russians in uh, Ukraine, Russian military, uh, Russian military equipment mm -hmm. uh, in Ukraine. You can define it any way you want. We have been very clear on this. We've said it. Uh, NATO has said it. General Breedlove has said it. Uh, this They've said incursion, though. U.S. officials haven't gone as far as to say invasion, which Ukrainian officials, as you know, have. Yeah. Have, have, well, have I'll, le I'll leave that to, to others who, mm -hmm. who worry about how you express yourself or what words you do. That's not my role. Uh, this will be an issue that uh, obviously will be very high on the agenda at NATO over the next two days. Mm -hmm. Do you, I mean, the reason I ask that question uh, is in part is because an invasion would uh, seem to require certain responses that, that an incursion or a limited military intervention would not. Um, but specific, let's get to the policy. The administration policy to this point, gradually raising the cost on the, the Russian economy, has been designed, so say administration officials, to de-escalate the crisis. Meanwhile, it is escalating, and, and even U.S. officials, uh, and, and yourself included, have described it that way. In light of that, is the U.S. policy regarding Ukraine a failure to this point? Well, let, let's, let's examine the, the, the facts here, Jim. Uh, the tension that has been rising and the escalation that's been occurring, that's been because of one individual. It's the president of Russia. It's not President Porchenko in Ukraine. It's not NATO. It's not the United States. It, it, it's the Russian president who continues uh, to uh, take to very dangerous escalatory yeah. actions. So that's number one. And I think it, in proper context, we should come at it. Second, uh, look, let's look at the damage that's been done to the Russian economy. The ruble is at a low time, an all-time low against any currency. Uh, it continues to find itself isolated in the world. Uh, you saw the recent announcement by the French government to, in fact, stop the sale of the Mistral uh, ship. Just today. Yeah. Today. Advanced uh, warships uh, with a helicopter capability. Uh, and you, you can go on to chart through all the other consequences so far that have occurred uh, that have had significant impacts on the Russian economy. I wouldn't say those are failures. I'd say those are pretty, pretty significant. Now, has it but accomplished? But if the goal is to de-escalate, that they have failed because well, Russia but, has kept on escalating military but Jim, if, do you want us not to do anything as, as, as Putin continues to escalate? No, no question. I, I'm, just, I'm just asking if the policy has been successful so far, and the evidence would seem to show that, that it hasn't. Well, the president's been, our president's been very clear. This is not a, a short-term deal. Mm -hmm. If President Putin continues, to escalate, as he has been, he continues to drive his country into a ditch. There will be long-term consequences for that, uh, as already the consequences are starting to show up. We are dealing uh, with this. We must, uh, NATO partners, all the countries of Europe, uh, in how we are handling this and how we are responding uh, to it, as we are supporting the Ukrainians. So it, it, it is a, not, not just a short-term issue here. But it's a longer-term issue. So um, w w I think the president, too, said very clearly last week, I mean, we're not going to, to, to a military engagement in a war with Russia over this. So right. then you look at the options that are responsible and how do you deal with this. And I think we're taking uh, uh, the responsible actions that we must and are pretty devastating to Russia. I just wonder if the Russian president is taking advantage of that understanding that because the U.S. will not 
uh, take additional steps, and in fact, even the economic steps have been slow in coming. There, there are critics on both sides of the aisle that, that the Russian president is taking advantage of that by making a fait accompli, for instance, the annexation of Crimea and the possibility of further territory under Russian control in eastern Ukraine. Well, whatever Putin's calculations are, are they are his calculations. Mm -hmm. uh, we have never recognized the annexation of Crimea. That is something that's going to have to be dealt with. Uh, as, as we work our way uh, through this. But uh, as we've said, I've said, the President said, all of our administration officials have said, uh, we need to get the tensions lowered, the escalation stopped, mm -hmm. and get into a position, and we can't control that. Uh, we can help it, we can foster it, our NATO partners can, where uh, this thing gets sorted out. So the world doesn't go to war over this. But there are things that we can do when we are doing. They're pretty effective right now. To, uh, to deal with Russia. You gave a speech just a short time ago here in Newport talking about uh, U.S. technological superiority and how countries, including mm -hmm. Russia and China, are challenging that uh, today, uh, and in particular how the U.S. needs financial resources, the Defense Department, to continue uh, to, um, to, 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 to keep that su superiority, that technological advantage. Uh, I wonder if you could describe how severe that threat is to Americans who, who might not be paying attention at home to the, advantage that, the advances, rather, that countries such as Russia and China are taking? Well, I've said uh, many times, and I think uh, all of our senior administration officials, starting with the President, the Vice President, that this uh, so-called sequestration, which is an unaccountable, irresponsible way to govern, well, in fact, it's not governing, it's deferring, um, it, it's terribly dangerous to the future capabilities of our national security Enterprise. Can you give an example just yes, for folks I can. back home? Um, uh, well, well, just a quick review of the bidding here. Uh, about three years ago, uh, there was a law passed by the Congress, signed by the President, to over a 10 year period take down about $490 billion from the Pentagon over a 10 year period. That'd be a reduction across the Where board. Where has that hit you the most and made in your well, that's view, only one, Jim, right. but that's only one thing. See, that isn't sequestration. Right. Sequestration is about another $50 billion in addition to that. Sure. Now, to give you an example of what happened to us last year when we, when we took the full brunt of almost a $100 billion cut in one year, steep, abrupt, immediate uh, cuts, shocks to the system, we had to stand down all of our training. Our Navy, our Air Force, our Marines, our Army couldn't train. Uh, we couldn't do maintenance. Um, we couldn't go forward with contracts. As you know, when we go forward with contracts to keep a technological edge, which mm -hmm. we've all, always had since World War II, um, that is years out. You start that now, but we won't see the benefit of that uh, for 10, 12 years. Those, those things uh, were stopped. As we reduce further our manpower, reduce further and cut into further every capability we have, it won't show up in a year or two. It will start showing up third and fourth uh, years mm -hmm. out. So when you look at the long range view of this, if we don't reverse sequestration, stop it, then it is going to have an impact on, on the future capabilities of our country to keep, if nothing else, the technological edge. When Russia and China, for example, continue to put in mm -hmm. significant amounts of money to keep, uh, not, on, not only keep them in the game, but to, but to jump us on capabilities. Now, they're not there yet. They won't be there for a Catching while, up? But they're catching up. Would you call Russian military intervention in Ukraine uh, the first or a first asymmetrical attack on U.S. and the West in the way they've carried this out? Uh, on you, you, forces out of uniform, for instance, use of separatists on the ground, et cetera? Well, I think it's this, uh, Jim, if nothing else. It, it, it is representative of the world that we're now dealing with. Mm -hmm the world that we're in, and I think the world we're going to be in for a long time to come. Mm -hmm. That's why our special operations, our cyber, mm -hmm. our technological edge, uh, our counter um, insurgency experience, our training, sophistication, intelligence, now comes together at a, at a point where it's always been important, of course. But now this is going to be the, the tip of the spear as we go out. We're always going to need a, a big, capable Navy and Army mm -hmm. and, and all the rest. But uh, expeditionary uh, work that the Marines were originally instituted for, right. they're going back to that. And, and we're seeing what 
to your point about what's going on with the Russians in Ukraine, I think more of, of what we'll probably be dealing with in the future. Right. Asymmetric. Asymmetric. Not, not land armies and tanks and so on c c contending for territory. But. I, I think that's right, but we have to be ready for everything. Right. Though. I mean, we, we can't disarm in s certain areas and then arm up in certain other areas. We don't have that luxury. The United States is the only nation on Earth that uh, helps other countries in the sense that we have a large portfolio. We're, you know, we're in over 150 countries. Mm. And uh, we're, we're more engaged in the world today than ever before, whether it's the uh, Asia Pacific uh, rebalance. And this uh, narrative that somehow has gotten some credibility out there that we're pulling back is just not true. Let me ask you about uh, the issues, uh, the stories that have just captivated Americans these last week uh, in the most horrible way. And that's, of course, the beheading of Jim Foley. Uh, journalist and Stephen Sotloff, which we just had confirmation yesterday and today. How is that a watershed event, do you believe? Uh, not just in terms of public perception of the threat from ISIS, but in terms of how uh, the U.S. responds to this threat? Um, it, it's probably a watershed event for a lot of reasons. One is the sophistication of ISIL, ISIS in their communicative uh, abilities, capacities, uh, they're as sophisticated as anybody out there in, in how they frame and how they use modern technology. That's partly what I was referring to when I said we've never seen anything quite like that. But that's just one part of it. When you're beheading people in, with the barbarism, the brutality uh, that is their uh, practice, uh, and then all the rest, and that, that's, not, uh, that's not unique in the sense of, of how they treat other people. And you, you, you know, and we have intelligence reports of some of the things, the atrocities they commit as they go through mm -hmm. uh, the, these villages. This is just beyond anything quite like we have seen. And uh, when you say watershed, well, I don't know about watershed, but it, but it is um, a look into where, where parts of the world may be going unless the United States along with our partners and our coalitions, stop it. This is the point the President was making. You've got to destroy it. Because if we don't destroy it, it will get worse. And it will get wider and deeper. I wonder about your personal reaction to seeing those videos uh, and those young American victims. I sensed in Vice President Biden's voice today uh, an, an emotional, a perfectly understandable emotional and angry response. We will chase them to the gates of hell. You're a veteran yourself. Uh, you fought in a war to protect uh, Americans, and you, you are, are now commanding uh, many soldiers who were doing exactly that. How did you personally react when you saw those videos? Jim, I, I think regardless of your background and your experience, mm -hmm. just as a human being, with, with having uh, some sense of decency mm -hmm. and respect for human life and other people, uh, it makes you sick to your stomach. But it again reminds us of the kind of brutality uh, and the barbarism that is afoot in some of these areas of the world. And it is our responsibility, uh, the President, the Vice President, mine, all of us, to do everything we can to stop this now. Because it, it won't just recede into the, into the gray recesses of history un, un, until we stop it. Uh, and I think we have to think about that. We, the emotionalism, of course, overtakes us all, but we've got to be clear-headed on this, too. We've got to be responsible. We can't overstate things. We can't understate things. We've got to be honest with the people of our country. We've got to be honest with these young men and women who serve our country. We've got to be honest with the world, what we're dealing with here. Let me ask you, finally, and I want to give the chance for the audience to ask questions of you as well. Does the President have the congressional authority he needs currently to carry out further strikes in Syria, or does he need to seek congressional approval before taking that step? Like I said, Jim, the, the White House, uh, all of us have been reaching out and conferring with the Congress. Um, we are looking at the different authorities that would come with the different options as to what would be required if any additional legal authorities would be uh, uh, required. Um, the President has been very clear that uh, anything he does, uh, uh, he wants the Congress to be part of that. He wants the legal authority uh, 
uh, and uh, he's been been straight straightforward about that uh, with all of us. So um, we're looking at all those options and what may be required, um, depending on what options the president wants to go with. Can you vow to the American people today that ISIS will not be just degraded or contained, but destroyed? <laughs> well, vows are. Uh, something uh, b beyond my mortal capacity uh, of doing, but uh, I can tell you this, Jim, uh, I know this about this president, this vice president, I know this about everyone in his administration, I know this about myself. We will do everything possible that we can do to destroy uh, their capacity to inflict harm on our people and, and uh, Western values and and uh, our interests. Everything you can do, everything the government can do. Secretary Hakel, thank you very much for your time. Thanks. We've covered a lot of ground here, uh, and I appreciate this, knowing what great challenges you and the people you command and serve have on your plate. So thank you very much. CNN and our audience appreciates it. Uh, Brooke, uh, you heard uh, the Secretary's uh, strong words on ISIL and on Ukraine, uh, echoing some of what we heard from the President uh, earlier today and the Vice President. Uh, I, think, I think as Americans in these coming days and weeks, we can, we can expect this to, to stay very much at the top of, of the administration's priorities, and I think uh, it's something that you and I, Brooke, are going to be covering very closely. So uh, I'm going to turn it back to you now. Thanks very much for giving us the time. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. I took more time than I promised. And that's why Admiral Kirby came up here behind the camera to slap me around a little bit. That's deserved. Yeah. Uh, These guys always do. We always you know, do that. They... But, but I, I will make a confession. There was a television moment there because about two minutes in, my earpiece came out of the back of my head. So I was, I was flying blind for, the, for that. I had no one talking to me. I had to rely on my producer here who was sending me hand signals. So we, we went old school for a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to blame technology. Uh, it's your turn, please uh, certainly want to hear your questions. The, I'm, I'm just the, uh, the mediator here, so it's your turn to, to quiz him. Good afternoon, Mr. Secretary. Lieutenant Colonel Cameron Pringle, U.S. Air Force. Uh, sir, I wondered if you could give us an update on the withdrawal from Afghanistan from your perspective, and uh, in particular if the administration is reviewing the timeline for that operation given the current situation in Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you for your service and thanks uh, for the question. Uh, everyone here knows that uh, uh, Afghanistan is struggling through this transition of power to new governments. And um, uh, we, the United States, and our ISAF NATO partners are doing everything we can to facilitate that peaceful uh, transition. But uh, in the end, it's up to the presidential candidates to come together and the people of uh, Afghanistan. Uh, to uh, make all, all of this work. Uh, we are still uh, on track to uh, follow through with uh, the President's uh, decisions uh, as we transition out uh, of a combat role and bring our forces down, and that retrograde is on track. Um, certainly at NATO, uh, over the next two days, this will be a very specific uh, agenda item because first, uh, we all had hoped that by the NATO summit uh, we would have a new Afghan president inaugurated. Uh, we would have a status of forces agreement for the ISAF NATO partners. We would have a bilateral security agreement signed with us. Uh, that's not happened. So it complicates the situation. But we're on track with uh, our NATO partners and uh, what we're doing and with the new commander uh, General J.C. Campbell. Uh, I spoke with him a couple of days ago. Uh, uh, we'll see, but, but, but we can help, we can facilitate, we can support, we can do everything we're doing, but in the end, uh, the Afghan people uh, have to resolve this difference in those two candidates, and I know President Karzai is helping uh, do that uh, as well. Hi, Secretary Hagel. This is a, a Commander Goad, U.S. Navy. Um, I just came from the NAVSENT command, where I was the lead Syria planner. And um, one of the things that my team uh, came up with when we were looking at the ISIL problem 
was that there, was, there seemed to be a strategic disconnect between how we treated ISIL when they related to Syria and how we treat ISIL as they relate to Iraq. Uh, when when we're, we're talking about Iraq, we want to fight ISIL. And when we are talking about Syria, well, we don't necessarily want to help them, but we want to leave them alone to do their business. Um, how do we solve the strategic disconnect between those two viewpoints and prioritize Iraq over Syria in that regard? Well, that's a good question. I, I don't think there's any policy disconnect. Uh, let's remember that our status in Iraq, our situation in Iraq is totally different from uh, our status and our, our, our situation in Syria. First of all, we have no presence in Syria. Uh, we do have a significant presence uh, in Iraq. Uh, uh, they uh, have been uh, an ally and a partner. Uh, as you know, we've continued to assist them in, in weapons and, and uh, since we had our role transitioned out a, a few years ago. Uh, the President was very clear on what uh, our interests are and protecting those interests in Iraq. First of all, it's our people. That was his first priority. You protect Americans, protect the embassy, the consulates, our strategic areas for us, the Baghdad International Airport. Uh, second, to um, assist, because they have been partners and allies, Peshmerga, Iraqi security forces, which we have been helping them, assisting, helping our allies uh, uh, as well. Uh, and then uh, also doing everything we can to assist them uh, with specific areas that uh, could uh, truly threaten the government uh, of Iraq and the, gov and the people of Iraq, Mosul Dam being uh, a good example. So the three priorities the President put on uh, and requirements put on us, um, on what he gave us license to do, Central Command, were predicated on those three principles. Syria is a whole different ballgame. Syria is not a matter of where ISIL is, and you have al-Nusra there, you have al-Qaeda there, you have many varieties of terrorist groups um, uh, in uh, Syria. Uh, that's a different situation for us. Um, it isn't a matter of just let ISIL be ISIL in Syria, but we also have uh, legal authorities, which Jim talked about, that we have to comply with. Uh, we, we have uh, legal authorities in Iraq to uh, help the Iraqis and to take those military strikes. Uh, uh, we would work through different authorities we would require, as Jim asked, if we would uh, take uh, uh, some of the same, uh, the President exercise some of the same options on kinetic strikes in Syria. Authority to do that international law, domestic law, and so on. So um, if I've not confused you totally, I mean, they are, they are really, uh, make no mistake, there's no question ISIL is as bad in Syria as it is in Iraq or wherever else it will be uh, or could be. That, that is not the issue. There's not as bad in Syria as they are in Iraq. But, but I think it's important that we define, as the President said, our interests and then what, what can we do within the boundaries of our authorities to do it? Uh, and then we're looking at the other options. Secretary Hagel. Lieutenant Colonel Shane Lohman, Air Force Reserves. Uh, I'm a citizen soldier. I'm a part-timer. And over the last 20 or so years, the reserve components of our, our services have played a significant role in the combat capability uh, of our armed forces. Where do you see the future of the reserve components in this, in these crises and future crises over the next 10 to 20 years? Uh, well, thank you. You, uh, you know, and um, everyone in this room knows, and in particular the National Guard and Reserve component members here, that uh, over the last 13 years, uh, our uh, defense enterprise has relied on, had to rely on, uh, the reserve National Guard components of our integrated services. The future for Reserves National Guard is going to be as important or more important than what we've seen in the past. Uh, I think that's right. I think that's smart. I think that uh, gives us value added across the system. Uh, all the reasons I suspect you agree. 
um, and there are more uh, reasons why the Reserve National Guard component will continue to be an integral fabric of our enterprise. Now, we'll work through tactical issues. I mean, there are differences uh, on training schedules and readiness schedules, and you, you know all those. But uh, uh, we, will, uh, we will have to rely on uh, Reserve National Guard components well into the future. Uh, second, third point I'd make would be the experience that you in the Reserves and National Guard gained over the last 13 years as uh, uh, being a part of that day-to-day uh, -day operating uh, dynamic of two long ground wars and everything it took to support those wars. We don't want to lose that experience. I don't mean by that, well, let's go get into another war. What I'm saying is that, that experience that you all gained is hugely valuable. And, and, and we don't want that edge to be lost. So in training, in schools, in universities, this setting, um, we'll continue to keep integrating the National Guard and Reserves into, uh, in, into the system. As I said, there will be differences in how, how we do that on platforms. I mean, uh, for example, the Army uh, Aviation brigades are shifting, and the regular Army has made some uh, recommendations which I accepted. I thought they were smart for everybody. Uh, they would trade out different platforms for National Guard platforms. Now, I know everybody doesn't agree with all that. That's okay. We'll work it out. So those kind of things we'll be working through. But the overall responsibility uh, and integration into the enterprise, uh, that is there. It is there to stay. Good afternoon, sir. Lieutenant Commander Jack Curtis, United States Navy. We, much like Mr. Shuda, rely very, very heavily on our technology to do our jobs well. Are you convinced, and if so, why, that we can compete against a, a near peer enemy if our earpieces are taken away from us? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your last. Uh, are, am I convinced what you were talking so fast? I don't know. <laughs> Yes, sir, I was, I, was, I was relaying how we, much like Mr. Shuda, rely very heavily on our earpieces, mm -hmm. our technology, to do our jobs well. Are you convinced, and if so, why, that we can compete and reign victorious against a near-peer enemy if we lose our earpieces? Oh. <laughs> very clever. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I wish I would have thought of that mm -hmm. then. Um, I did have him at my mercy, uh, you know. I mean, I saw the earplug fall out, but I, <laughs> I'm just too fair-minded uh, to do that. But uh, uh, that's a very good question, and I like the way you put it. Um, I think uh, there are probably three components of an answer to your question. One is people. Um, you all know in this room, uh, like any institution, uh, the most important asset that any asset uh, can be or any country or organization, institution has, is its people. If they are not quality people to start with, if they're not trained, capable, ready, committed, then, then you got a flaky outfit, quite frankly. The military cannot be flaky. That's one outfit that can't be flaky. So you start with people. So I want to answer your question, if we can continue to keep the kind of people that we have now and we have had, that's first. Second, speech I gave uh, a couple of hours ago that Jim referred to, the technological edge, uh, innovation. That is a critical component of this. Uh, this institution has played a very historic role in that over many, many years. Uh, this area of the country has and continues, uh, especially with the Navy. Um, that technolo technological edge has to stay there. We've got to continue to advance that. And third, I would say, um, in answer to your question, your partnerships. Um, you know that much of our strategy has been over the last couple of years, and certainly I've been, since I've been here for a year and a half, Secretary of Defense, is to help capacity building of our partners. The world is too complicated what Jim said about asymmetric challenges. Uh, the world's too big, too vast, 
The fusion of economic power now is historic, unprecedented for one nation, as great and powerful as we are. We can't do all this stuff alone. We, do, we can't do it. We, we need partners. We need capable partners. We need partners that are integrated to some sense into what we're doing. NATO is a good example of that, but, but you, you've got one NATO. But even within NATO, uh, there are differences. But what we're doing in Asia Pacific as we build new partnerships and relationships uh, and all the new things that we've been doing, the Navy's been a huge uh, part of that. Uh, as we're doing with GCC countries uh, in the Middle East, we've got to have competent, capable partners to um, also help answer your question. So when, when our uh, earpiece falls out, <laughs> uh, we can still, uh, we can still uh, win and still uh, deal with any, uh, uh, with any challenge that uh, comes along. And we, ha we have to be in a position with this enterprise, build this into the high ground so that whatever that challenge is, and nobody, I don't think here, you're all smart, but I don't think anybody here is so smart they can predict what's gonna, what the world's gonna look like in five years or 10 years. And I use cyber as an example. I mean, 10 years ago, cyber, what's the problem? Uh, no, there were varying degrees of, yeah, that's going to be a threat. But anybody really doesn't understand the threat of cyber today, you're not, you're not tracking. So we've got to be prepared and build an institution as, as, as much as we can, as best we can, to prepare for tomorrow's challenges, even they'll be uh, unknown. Uh, good afternoon, Secretary, Lieutenant Commander Geyer, U.S. Navy. Uh, my question is, we've talked a lot about military ethics here uh, in our first trimester of the War College. And when you watch the national news, you see a lot of retired military weighing in on the current situations in the world. I uh, wanted to see if you had a, your, what, what your perspective was on military and whether or not we should remain apolitical uh, in our retirement time as well as when we're in service. Interesting. Well, um, do you want to handle that? Uh, All sure. Right, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I, I've thought about this because I'm occasionally the subject of that commentary. Mm -hmm. But uh, <laughs> uh, first, um, when, a, when an individual retires from the military um, uh, after a long and dedicated, selfless career, uh, I think it, it should be up to the individual to use his or her own judgment on uh, what they want to do afterward, what, what their own sense of propriety is. Um, and I think, we, this is my own personal opinion about it, uh, I know there are various uh, opinions, and matter of fact, I've had some recent conversations with some uh, current uh, senior uh, military leaders about what they think. Um, there are varying degrees of this, but um, I think it's really up, up to the individual. I, I would not want to see us as a military get into a situation where we are making um, people sign something that they can't speak their mind or what they think as a citizen of the United States of America after they defended the rights of people to express themselves for their careers. And um, I do think it's a personal uh, uh, decision. And um, I know that's not a very good answer, but I, 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 that's, I think that's the smarter way, uh, uh, way to do it. I have an abundance of faith in the American people and if, if nothing else, I've always believed, and the older I get, the more convinced I'm right on this, wrong on a lot of things, but right on this. <laughs> uh, you can always rely on the common sense and judgment of the American people. Now, we all react to things quickly, but in the end, we, we stabilize, we self-correct, we can think things through. And um, I'll always put my faith in that, and I think when former military leaders get up on television or give speeches, whatever they want to do, it's their right to do it. I think their audience factors that in 
uh, sometimes, whether you agree with the individual or don't agree uh, uh, with them. But again, I think it comes back down to it's, a, it's the individual's uh, call on that. And, and I, I uh, have to assume that uh, people who give of themselves so completely in their families for careers um, are capable of figuring that out and wouldn't uh, do anything, I don't think, to put themselves over, over uh, uh, in front of, the, uh, in front of um, what's right for our country. Mr. Secretary, I think we have time for one more question, I'm told. As, as much as I want to take it, I know Admiral Kirby would bound across the straight stage and tackle me, so I think I should leave it for the, <laughs> for the audience. I don't want to see that. Uh, no. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Mbigao. I'm from Croatia, but a member of this team here for this year at least, and future, of course. My question refers to the, against out of the scope of the uh, Homeland Security here. It goes to the Libya. It's been three years since the NATO alliance and the coalition stopped uh, operations under the umbrella of the United Nations to protect the civilians in Libya. Since then, and especially nowadays, that, that the situation there is a little bit in the shadow of the current situation in uh, Middle Asia and uh, in Ukraine. Uh, the government of the Libya just pronounced that they, they, they fall apart. And uh, the parliament voted uh, three weeks ago, if I'm not wrong, uh, they call for the international support of the security forces in Libya. So can you give us your overview of that situation and what international community, I'm not referring to the US specifically here, may or should do at this time to this crisis, sir? Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, and we're glad you're here. And uh, we thank your country uh, for your friendship uh, as well. Um, Everyone here knows um, Libya is a very difficult problem, starting for the Libyan people. Um, I think we, we um, the nations of the world who care about Libya, uh, NATO, countries of the region, uh, all have some responsibility to help uh, the Libyan people. But again, um, we're limited in, in, in how much uh, we can do um, to impose from the outside um, uh, our framework of governance uh, or decision making um, is not right. Uh, the Libyan people have, uh, and the different interests have to, to find some common ground enough to start being able to work through uh, these differences. We can help facilitate that, and I think we have some responsibility to do that. Um, we can assist uh, uh, with that. We can um, help build coalitions to do that. But uh, it is, it, it, you know, it's very, very difficult um, uh, and heartbreaking what's going on uh, in that country um, with the kind of resources Libya has, with the kind of potential Libya uh, has, uh, to see the devastation that's going on there. So uh, another, another big problem. Uh, and um, when you look around the Middle East, uh, there's not a lot of happy news uh, or stability in that entire region. And I think uh, going back to a point that uh, Jim made in a question, and uh, I'll end this, this way, that Whatever decisions President Obama make or other leaders make, certainly I think I can reflect on President Obama on this point, has to be uh, made not with just short-term interests, but long-term thinking. I mean, how is this going to affect the long-term outcome and consequences? Now, I recognize, President Obama does, that uh, inaction has consequences, as well as actions have consequences. But you don't want to make it worse. You know, different actions we can take could make it worse. Uh, so we got to be smart, as smart as we can be, dealing with the short term, but also thinking through the long term as to, as to how we, we want to help build something for the future as we, as we work through these more immediate decisions to help um, the Libyan people. But I, I would apply that to every country in the Middle East. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, Admiral Howe. And thanks to all of you for, uh, for, for welcoming me, certainly giving us the time, and welcoming uh, 
a few million CNN viewers, we hope, Jim, thank you. <laughs> today. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Jim, thank, thank you. you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Admiral. Thank you.